And here we are. Every, hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, AR Explainer. Um, very special episode today. I'm going to bring in my guests one by one. We've got Nathan and Alex. Hey, guys. <clears throat> hey. hey, man. What's up? Um, great to have you here. This is the latest episode of AR Explainer. It's a show where we talk about um, brand experience, technology, um, brands, museums, B2B, B2C, all the Bs, the C2s, the Bs, the Bs to the Gs, any combination of B, numeral two, and letter. That's what we're covering. So you, if you just tuned in, you know exactly what to expect from this episode um, because I've been super clear about it. Anyway, today we have uh, a really great guest. We've got Nathan Woodhead, who is creative director at Fleischmann Hillard Fishburn in London. Um, give us a wave in the center there, if you would. Um, you can uh, just enter in the comments or if you're watching this after who you think has the cooler hat. Um, I kind of know <laughs> the answer, uh, but hey. Um, also, we've got uh, Alex Paulson, CEO of Indie, uh, the world's best and brightest and coolest and my favoriteest uh, augmented reality company oh, um, and longtime buddy. We were just talking over his CV and prep of this, um, and he has many illustrious career moves that he has made, um, <laughs> including Dentsu, um, yeah. including uh, various magazines, Dazed and Confused. He was in that with Matthew McConaughey. As I several understand, times, yeah. several times. Yeah. So, I pretty much mentored him from day one. Well, there you go. Which was, so, which was nice. Um, today's, yeah. today's topic is, um, <clears throat> is one I think that, that many agencies and, and brands are, are grappling with right now. So the, the question is, how do you create, how do you cultivate a total brand experience in a pandemic area, era? So the usual touch points that we are, um, used to dealing with. I think every brand has some kind of physical activation uh, built in. They don't just use digital. They don't just use PR. There's the whole the 360 integrated mix that they used to, right? Um, and you got the deck in front of you. Yeah, well, I have the, I have the <laughs> sheet. And uh, we are the most complete into whatever agency that is. So I'm sure Fleischmann, uh, full disclosure, um, I'm a former employee of Fleischmann Hillard, uh, which is a great agency. Um, but I think uh, every every big agency is is looking to offer that that full mix right now, and I think it's um, really only the really strong ones that are able to explain to clients how they can make those things um, all work together. So we wanted to invite Nathan on, who's working with um, tons of cool brands like Krispy Kreme Donuts, like Fitbit, like Iceland Air, and talk through some of the ways that you've been navigating this um, strange world. Um, and then figure out how the whole technology part fits in or when, when it makes sense and when it doesn't. So that's my uh, long-winded intro as usual. Um, so just to, to kick things off, Nathan, uh, my first question to you is how are you? I'm fine, thank you. I'm really well, actually. I'm, I moved house recently, so uh -oh. I've just had a few days off to unpack boxes, which has been um, as, as riveting as I'm sure you can imagine. <laughs> um, I would like us to find a new uh, way of referring to these unprecedented strange times, though, because okay. I'm sick of hearing that <laughs> phrase. Constantly. It was five or three months, wasn't it? And then now, yeah. now it's like it's not even unprecedented anymore. It's pretty much normal. Can can you can we coin a new phrase here? I mean, you are a creative director, so um, also a copywriter, I guess. So can you just <laughs> do that right now, and then that will be done. We'll sort that have immediately. That Okay. Can I have till the end of the session to think sure. about it? Just so I can, yeah, okay. I'll You're workshop just, some things while we're chatting. I'm, I'm just going with bleak. Bleak, okay. Yeah. Bleak times, I think. Bleak is the, times. Um, Ever the optimist. <laughs> we know. Glass half full, guys, I've known you for 15 <laughs> years. So uh, very good. And, and Nathan, I know that you've also come off just a big uh, virtual project, which is maybe um, kind of a side project, but just to throw that up there, the Creative Coalition um, has just put on a, a three-day extravaganza, which I've really enjoyed uh, tuning into. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about uh, that first? Because I think that's an interesting experience that you've cultivated, not for one particular brand, but basically for a whole community. So that was a really interesting thing to be part of. Earlier this year, I was um, part of a bunch of um, of workshops and consultation um, projects with the uh, Creative Industries Federation and Creative England. And it was basically a big dialogue with all of the creative sectors to talk about 
um, how we can all support each other, what they need, how the funding issues are arising. And out of the back of that, they invited me to host a panel at the um, at the at that event on Monday. And it was amazing to bring together all these different people. So over three days, they had a bunch of creatives who were talking about um, where we are now, what we need to readjust and what the future might look like. And it was sort of framed over three days in, in that um, framework. And it was done in a way which was about access. It was about inclusivity. And actually, it was supposed to be a physical event, but they decided to make it digital for obvious reasons. Um, and the thing that was most interesting about what I was most surprised about was the fact that they made it feel like an actual festival. It felt like an event whilst it was all online. Um, the platform it was on had all of these different things that meant you could um, have a main stage area. There were several different areas where people could do talks and things, but there was breakout rooms where they had workshops going on and like you could navigate around this thing live while all this stuff was happening mm -hmm. and find yourself in a, in a networking event with a bunch of people. There's this, there's this part of it where you could go in and have six minute speed dates with people. So they'd done a whole load of stuff, which made this entire festival still feel like a real event whilst actually it was all just happening online. I was really amazed by the technology actually. And I can't remember what the platform's called. Hop in. But I will it was hop, hop in. in. It, yes. it was so know. good. Have you used yeah. it? Uh, I have indeed. So it's a it's a really useful lots of belt lots of bells and whistles, but still very simple. So um, click the affiliate link for hop in down here, as we usually <laughs> do name checking platforms. But I thought it was really good. And what I what I really enjoyed um, outside of the panels were the um, the performances. Uh, so there was a lot of actual um, you know just straight up culture, right? Um, without the panel, which is sometimes nice not to have to listen to three people talk live. Um, so <laughs> how, like how do you think <laughs> yeah, right, that you saw what I did there? And, um, you know, so I, I just wonder, how do you go about cultivating? I, I know that you're not the main organizer, but, you know, just in terms of bringing artists together, um, I'm sure that you've seen that on, on a brand level, too. So the the idea of bringing performing artists in whatever whatever their performance is how does that work are people are performers ready to take those calls right now do they have like time <laughs> or what's up yeah i think it's really it, it, we're at a really interesting time actually and um i think lots of people have been through a, a transformative time during this big pause we're in um and i say pause very purposefully because when we come to things like performers and some of the uh, softer ends of the creative industry so the arts and and theater and things people have literally been out of work they've been sat doing nothing and actually lots of them are self-employed or freelancers so they have no access to opportunity there's no funding for them and there's been very little in terms of government support so there's been a a sort of reconsideration of how these people have been working i I've, I've found and actually you, I've been having interesting dialogues with different people who perhaps you might not be able to ordinarily have access to mm -hmm. simply because they either have, have time or the capacity to do things. But when in the context of that festival, um, Creative England and the Creative Industries Federation do a lot of work to support people year round, uh, way before um, COVID hit. They also distribute funds. So they have lots of good relationships with people. Creative England partly funded um, Steve McQueen's latest um, films that are on the BBC this this week. And so he was at the festival and they'd managed to create a universe of lots of different people who represented different parts of the industry um, through through the network, basically. And I really agree with you, like it made the whole thing feel so much more dynamic to have. Uh, we, we weren't just talking theory stuff that we were talking about was happening live. People created new pieces. Um, perform stuff that they're well known for and it all happened within this this digital context I think for anyone who um, is watching uh, there will be some uh, content coming out of that I think they're releasing in the next few days so there'll be things you can see from various people but George the poet was a particular favorite of mine his performance was really good and Connie Hook actually um, started a new podcast series as part of the festival called Pigeonholed where she interviewed various people so there's a bunch of interesting stuff coming out of it. Cool I mean I, I thought it was really fun to watch it was one um, uh when I was really, I mean, there are a lot of things that come in your inbox nowadays um, or you're through your LinkedIn feed. Uh, of course, I saw it first 
because we're connected on LinkedIn and I saw that you were presenting. Um, then I looked a little bit deeper and I thought that is something I would want to spend several hours on. And I can't say that about many things. Um, so congrats to you and the organizers um, on that one. Uh, just to shift to the just to the pure brand world, which is where both of you gentlemen uh, tend tend to work um, in your for your kind of like daily salary, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, so when you talk about um, and 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 Nathan uh, and Alex too, I know that you you both kind of work in often in a B two C environment where you're you're going off to just um, regular people who need to get excited about uh, brands or uh, sports players. Um, or just, you know, things that basic things that make our lives better, at least in marginal ways. Right. So, um, and, and just to think about how brands are actually connecting, um, right now with, with their audiences. And it, it strikes me that it's, it's a very, um, unique moment. I'm, I'm afraid to use the adjectives from before unprecedented and whatever, but it's leading to a lot of different creative routes that you might not see before. And one, uh, I remember from, uh, you know, working in London, the the biggest joke of the London creative community is like the the most ridiculous thing that you could do is float something down the Thames. Um, I don't know if everybody knows that, but that's a, like a very inside go to, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's kind of like okay, so we've got all right. these ideas. We're not sure if they're going to fly, but the last one is, is a big boat with a huge duck on it. Kind of right. so like that's the. So if if you ever show up in a London agency as an outsider, and the creative people want to make you feel um, like an outsider then they will talk about this as if you should know that anecdote. Um, that never happened to me. Um, so I don't have any experience with that. But I've been course, in that meeting. I've, yeah. I've, heard, I've heard that pitch, yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah, OK. I'm sure you, you, in your time, you also ran that meeting. Um, and then you, you, know, you heard someone with an accent like mine, and you were like, ah, we're going to make this guy feel bad. Um, I, I was just a young pup. I yeah, know. anyway. So, so, you're, you're, you're <laughs> uh, so what, what did, of course, what did Amazon Prime do? Uh, very recently is that they they did exactly that and um, it, it, it created a huge debate um, I saw in the in the creative community is it is it exactly as cliche, as cliche as we said it was or is it the most genius thing ever because of the time we live in and blah 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 and it is, isn't it right on brand for Borat right because Borat is completely whatever the word is like uh, John Waters meets um, Sasha Baron Cohen, <laughs> whatever, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, so that is something that would not have happened a year ago. So Nathan and Alex, why is it okay or not okay this year to do to, to, to make that a touch point for your brand? Uh, do you want to start, Nathan, or do you want me to? Sure, <laughs> I'll start for sure. So basically, uh, uh, this for me has, there's never been a better time to float something down the Thames, right? We're not allowed near each other. Um, you, people can't come to your events and, and experience your brand how you might want them to. And this uh, much, people love to hate, as you as you just said, Alex, people love to hate um, floating stuff down the Thames. Um, but actually, in the context of the world we live in right now, it's an incredibly visible, incredibly noisy thing to do. And they supported the whole thing with a whole load of other stuff. So they did a bunch of projections onto buildings. So they basically did all of the um, the nuts and bolts of London gorilla stuff you could do all in one hit. So they floated that down the Thames. They projected some images onto the Houses of Parliament or Tower of London. And um, it, it all had this wear a mask theme to it. It landed coverage everywhere. It got loads of people talking and it totally entirely fits with what the film's about. And I think that actually, when we're talking about reaching consumers at the moment, we have to look at the best of what we already know. Of course, we can use future innovation, but actually I've been relying on my years of experience and things I've done before to work out what the best paths forward for people are. And it's all, and I know we always do that to an extent, but I've never relied more heavily on knowing what the, um, the risks with things are because actually we've been entering into conversations daily with people where there's so much uncertainty sitting around and you have to be able to give your clients counsel which allows them to move forward with some degree of confidence particularly during the last few months i think as we look forward things are getting a little bit less pressured around things having to actually work you can be a little bit more risky you can try new things out because things are starting to feel like they're easing up but this is the sort of thing where I would have gone into a room and said, okay, 
I mean, I don't know who even who did the work on this, but th there's a whole load of surefire things out of the back of this. They wanted to get coverage and attention around the fact the film was launching, and it worked. That was everywhere. I think I think I think it's completely valid in the sense that if 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 the metric is to gain press coverage and attention, I, I think that's I, I don't think anyone could ever question that. Ever, you know, it it is it is a cliche thing to do. And it is you you know you could just as easily go and go and spend you know a million quid and buy half a front cover of the Sun newspaper in London in the UK, you'd you'd have approximately the same eyeballs. Um, so in that sense, it, it's completely valid. I think I, I think this year has kind of put as as Nathan right, rightfully points out, there's less appetite for risk. <clears throat> so is this is this going to be featured in? 250 news outlets in let's say in the UK or in London, for example, then it ticks the box. Um, but it, <clears throat> but to a certain extent, does it, does it really provide any kind of value? The question is, is if you're promoting the film, you only need to provoke, promote the attention for it for a certain amount of time before it disappears. So that's a little bit different, obviously, to when you're sort of saying, okay, are we going to take this particular brand and kind of start to roll it into different places in different ways, add value, add connection, et cetera. So, they're kind of two different things in a way. There's also the thing here, right, whereby actually they, they started a debate around this debate we're having now about whether it was good or not. And the, Borat's all about debate, right? It's all about pr poking fires on different sides of opinions. And even that launch moment, it, there were a whole load of people who were really um, vocal about how bad they thought it was and that, it, that they were upset by it. Um, disrespecting royal property, whatever it is. like. <laughs> so it started the debate right from the off, which I think, you know what, I, you've got to give them a bit of um, kudos for, for the results that came out of it. But do you not find, I mean, we're in the kind of, in that sort of world sometimes as well, it's like the, the, the odd side effects that were, you know, oh, you're actually going to get potentially sued because of you've kind of brought shame on the queen, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they didn't really anticipate that, but they were happy to kind of ride on the coattails of that when it got mentioned. So that wasn't kind of necessarily part of the meeting, but they kind of go, oh, hold on a minute. There's another, you know, there's another 250 column inches there. Let's, let's kind of, let's put out a press release about that too. I think that the thing that, you know, it's that paddy power mentality, right? Their whole ethos is, uh, would it have cost us yeah. more in paid media than if we get sued for doing it? Yeah. And if the answer is no, then they just get on with it. <laughs> they just do it. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is a, there is an absolute purity to it. I, I, would I would I ever want to get involved in it? No, but I can I can totally understand how. I like ultimately they have you know I mean for people who going to a certain extent outside of the industry, you know that deck goes in. You know that deck has four different directions, and the agency and all of us around this table will have considered which one we think the client would go for. And 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 they would all have been, they probably would have all been slightly different. There probably been one in there that was kind of quite innovative and slow burn. And then they looked at the number and they looked at the amount of time they've got and they thought, well, if you just have a massive inflatable bore out with a mask around his penis, that's right. guaranteed. But but what it means now is that he the you know the floating thing floating something down the Thames idea is 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 done for a year. It can't be done for a year. So, um, how, how long do we have to wait? I guess just just so I know. I mean, and so I, so I can give like expert counsel to my clients. How long do I have to wait until I can propose this and successfully uh, execute it? Nathan, just give us give us a, 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 a number in months each of you just to close off this topic. Um, I I I will never ever <laughs> go into a room and suggest floating something down the thames it does it's not within my um my <laughs> gift of ideas like it doesn't ever come up for me as a as a natural solution for things <laughs> okay. so your number is your number of months is infinity months um yeah. alex how many I, months? I would say I, I i personally i would never do it i'm, I'm totally okay. related on this but on the flip side of that if i was in an agency and i saw how much press they'd got and I've got something else coming up in a month's time, and I look at what it costs them a hundred grand to do it. I'm kind of like, yeah, there's, there's no, there's inherently no shame in doing it again because by default it's already kind of sort of laden with it anyway. You know, no, like outside of the bubble, 
no one's really having this conversation. I mean, like exactly. everyone's just going, oh, that bloody Borat film's out. I need to work. There's that Giuliani thing going on as well, isn't there, et cetera. And that's, so it yeah. did its job. But, and by the way, we just have to take a quick pause for me to, to sell you some cigars oh. um, in my Rudy Giuliani. I don't know if you know that. So Rudy Giuliani, anyway, separate, separate thing. In his, uh, in his, the election's rigged, he takes a break and he does a cigar commercial <laughs> in his YouTube video. That's how he's monetizing the 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 fraud so we have to stop right there because i will take over this broadcast um with that we need to do it can we just do an election special yeah. and get it all out of the way oh my gosh if and then we can just um, do that I'll, I'll happily devote one hour uh, and then and then we can just get it all out and then no one will watch it and we'll be happy and it'll be done <laughs> well, I mean, i've got I've, I've got a build on the uh, before we move on to elections or not i've got a build on the floating things down the thames which is um in the world of brand experience, Airbnb did something uh, some years ago where they floated like a Dutch barge that had been turned into a cute little blue house down the Thames and then you could stay on it. There was like a ballot lotto thing to stay on it and, and have a night there. I think that that's a really interesting way of doing that thing. And it, arguably you could do it anywhere, but you wouldn't get the press shot in quite the same way. It's that basically it's the floating by tower bridge that people want. And actually there's a little piece of land next to tower bridge called Potter's Field. And if you Google PR stunt Potter's Field, there's about one a week in there where there's just like, <laughs> there are people are doing stuff in that space or brand pop-ups, brand activations all the time. Um, so Airbnb did a really interesting job of that though. It's worth looking at how they, they did that um that experience thing with that. Okay. So it can but be that's that. like that's lovely in the sense that that's giving people an opportunity to actually try the product effectively. I mean that's like that's actually rarer than you would hope. Um I mean it's, it's using the kind of slightly sort of awful arts of kind of getting the press shot, but at the same time someone's actually considered, well, this is the product and the product doesn't the product doesn't have the product isn't necessarily a two bedroom apartment in Vienna. It can be a boat in Huddersfield. It can be, you know, it can be a disused aeroplane in Iceland. It, you know, that's the that's the kind of there's there's the power in that. There's thought gone into that, no? No. And yeah. just you know, a, a, a total um, perfect segue is just to to drop in a comment we had from the crowd. Uh, Nathaniel's hat is <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. um, I'm not sure. What, Look, you know um, what? Like, I'm going to keep score. You don't worry about it. I'll keep score. You just slap them up, all right? Okay, all right, fair enough. And then other, just uh, in just a, a comment uh, again. Uh, this was on the pandemic, the unprecedented times thing. So nobody ever, you know, nobody is really understanding how to speak about it. They're surprised by it. So it's definitely, I think we can agree that it's a hard thing to describe in a way that is like constantly fresh and new, right? Like what's the new way we talk about but, the last but, month of misery? But don't so. forget like going just to kind of not, this is totally off topic, but very quickly, like I remember years and years after 9-11, I remember them saying that one of the biggest issues on repeating the same footage and the things happening and were the kids were experiencing it again and again and again. Mm -hmm. So adults kind of switched off and said, okay, this has happened and it's terrible. Whereas kids saw it two days later and, and it was it was a new event. And yeah. I think for a lot of young people, a lot of kids right now, then it's, you know, things like the lockdowns. I think it's just like, oh, my God, you know, it's happening again. Anyway, sorry, that's yeah, I mean, I think a that, valid thing. That, that actually, I think that's, a total, that's totally on, on track, actually. I mean, it, it speaks to the, the complexity of, of um, creating creative right now, right? So it used mm -hmm. to be that you kind of, you could take the temperature of a, of a culture, um, uh, you know, on a six-monthly or... 12 monthly basis and you would kind of know the audience that you're speaking to. Um, I remember back in the day doing some, like in the first few months of the Trump administration in 2017, we did some creative that was lampooning him, but we didn't know that every day he would reinvent himself in insanity, right? So you would make fun of one quote of his and then like the month after it was no longer even relevant because he had a new one, right? So um, just to make a, a quick segue, uh, Nathan, I know that, um, FH, Fleischmann, Hitler, and Fishburne, and FHF, um, actually, they, they did something very zeitgeisty with Krispy Kreme, which <laughs> I'm going to throw up right now, um, which speaks to that moment right after, this is like right after the UK lockdown, right? So can you tell us more about that and the process that you went through to um, create this kind of um, brand experience, which is on the other spectrum of technology and wowness? It's something very simple. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, this was one of those situations where the client comes to you and says, we need to do something for Super Saturday, which was the Saturday all the stores were reopening. Um, and lo essentially lockdown felt like it was the first day of it being over to some degree. They're like, we need to do something that's going to get some news for us and put us in um, uh, in the spotlight online. What can we do that's going to cut through all the noise that's happening on that Super Saturday? And I mean, that day was everyone was putting stuff out. Everyone was trying to get some attention. And the team just um, brainstormed up a bunch of ideas. And, and this one was about just creating a box that allowed people to share one of their um dozen original glazed and uh still socially distanced safely i mean this sort of stuff is the sort of thing you do in with no time on like a really tight budget you just go shoot it these are like this is rom and rosh who work in the office it's rosh's dog like we had the box <laughs> made we like you know you go do this stuff and then they were available in in certain stores but like this is about just working out how you can do something that feels utterly of the moment and is going to give people actually a bit of a smile you know one of the things i keep talking about now is that um w when i'm talking to clients like things have to matter at the moment you can't be quite as frivolous as we we used to be people aren't buying into a lot of nonsense um but people still do want to be entertained and have a little smile at some stuff and that Krispy cream example is a really good way of us um doing a product story in the middle of a whole load of chaos and being able to have a really fun time with it the team had such a laugh during the shoot as well <laughs> so just to pick up i mean i think there, there are two big buckets of creative right now one is the really heavy purposeful brand stuff right which i have a few examples of that as well and then i think that's really interesting there's the um quick smile stuff right the remembering that people still want just a moment to escape. They just want a moment just to be distracted or to have a laugh. Um, it's kind of the Emily in Paris effect, right? That's a really terrible show, but it's great escapism. Um, if you haven't seen it, you should definitely binge it. Um, but did you this, see? Did you see that they they put out Netflix UK put out a thing saying Emily should rhyme with Paris, Emily Paris. <laughs> The, the, well, the, the, the Twitter account went wild yesterday. Exactly. I mean, how, how, this is the, the, like, what is it? This, that, that's like peak frivolity, right? Is that the frivol frivolousness? Is it yeah. frivolity? So yeah. um, I, I just want to, you know, I think that technology can be extremely frivolous, right? And can actually bring, um, you know, it's those little moments where you can actually inject just a little bit, like a dose of technology, and then it does something cool. And, um, it, it makes me think of my my daughters, um, one of which is seven years old, and uh, and yes, she's on TikTok, and yes, privacy issues in the Chinese, whatever. She's a really great photo editor now, and I'm really proud of her, now, our video editor. So, and she's making some really cool stuff. Stop motion. Only on videos up to 14 seconds. <laughs> well, yeah, whatever. Now you can put it for a minute, and we were. Making... Oh, you can do a minute. Oh, got it. Yeah, yeah. So, we're, yeah. so, but you know, uh, TikTok, Snapchat, Facebook, whatever. Um, and I just wanted to throw up. Uh, this the idea and everybody knows about filters ar lenses um and this is something that that you guys do at indie alex um mm -hmm. i wonder if you know we have so many of these different little moments that are uh that are happening pre-lockdown post-lockdown during lockdown and they're different in every market every country right everyone mm -hmm. is now on a different time schedule so the i think the one one reason quick sidebar why the u.s election was so um, widely anticipated and followed is because that was the one thing that we were all doing at the same time, right? Yeah, it was the one bit of global Western shared experience that we had was the, you know, expletive <laughs> thing happening over there, refreshing um, the page that was updating itself, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> like the continuous. If I refresh it, does does Nevada come quicker? Right. So, so okay. So I'm going to take us back out of that um, and go back into the really frivolous stuff that can't destroy the world. Um, and, and if you're looking at like these little moments, so, you know, where a brand could say, okay, lockdown has just started again in, in Budapest and in, in Los Angeles in London. And then you have that, the Snapchat filter that, that brightens your day for that. Right. Or the, you know, there's something yeah, that's really ephemeral in that moment. 
I th I think connecting uh, like I, I think connecting in with people in their particular place of habitat is 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 actually really hard. I mean, if you look at the Bora thing, you know you can pretty much probably cover four national newspapers. You can do fifty websites on a demographic from you know whatever eighteen to fifty five, for example. But with stuff like that, it's it, it to a certain extent it's more targeted. You know there are certain people like your kids who are potentially just consuming most of their content through places like TikTok or Insta. There's a lot of, there's a lot of people that age who are actually consuming, you know, they're living in that environment. They're consuming news through that environment, which is, is concerning from that perspective. But at the same time, that's where they are. That's what they inhabit and that's where they live. And I think <clears throat> I'm kind of, I'm, I'm sort of a big fan of, I've, I've always been a big fan of, of giving something to people. I, I don't. <clears throat> I don't believe that. I, I think that advertising is is going to have to be is is increasingly going to have to be a transaction, and I don't. I don't believe that the the kind of broadcast of things is is. It's not. It's not that it's going away. I'm not sort of here to sort of destroy anything, but I I, I feel like it's evolving, and uh, digital's giving the opportunity for you to to deliver something to someone and also potentially get your message across, and that's that's like, that's it's relatively rare it's it's less rare than it was but you know in in the sort of gorilla the older days of you kind of using gorilla you you could <clears throat> you could try to kind of present something to someone that they could keep or they could use or or they could have fun with for a, an extended period of time and it's it, to me it's it's often it's difficult to understand i i you know a lot of agencies or, or brands for example will want will want to get press and that's a completely valid point uh, we don't tend to work in that space. We tend to work in the space where, okay, can we create something of, that's tangible for you to have? Well, I mean, I have to say, you know, TikTok or the brands making those those filters, I, I, I don't necessarily remember the brands themselves, but I do think that filters and TikTok have made certain moments of the last year since March or April more interesting for me and my family because they've actually given mm. us something to do. Um, <clears throat> My, my my daughter was not interested in TikTok before that, but then, but I think she was one of the millions that started during lockdown. Um, and then, you know, when when you're sitting, and I, I apologize again for the the, the light actually because it's so dark now, which makes me think of how dark of a time it is. And when you can't leave the house because you're on lockdown, maybe and you, you should have, host Jeopardy. You do have that <laughs> when they're looking for you. <laughs> this is totally inappropriate what you're saying. Um, you've just you've crossed all the lines. Um, even even Fox News wouldn't have you. They're a reputable organization now. Um, and I, ironically, I did used to work with Greg, Greg Gutfeld, who's the host, oh, yeah. one of the hosts on the at Maxim. Okay, there you go. That all ties right. it all okay. back in again. Sorry, yeah, I'll show so, up. But so anyway, I guess my my point was, which I've completely lost, is that there it, there is a role in my mind to creating these like nice, mo like very short moments of delight with the family. And I always look at things, you know, if I have two, two small kids, I always look, I'm like the family, the family demo now. Right. So I'm always thinking about what I would, my, my, my life is built around the time I spend with them and I have to spend all my time with them because none of us are allowed to go anywhere. So what, what is going to keep us, what's going to fill our day. And I see that things like, like that, or even this, the net, this Netflix show called The Floor is Lava. I don't know if you've seen it. It's so it's, stupid. It's, so, it's stupid. so stupid. They love it, though. They love it. It's stupid for, it's stupid for, <laughs> for people who know better. But if you don't, I mean, they're <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, But I think there's, but it's that, that's the value, though, isn't it? That's, right. that's the value that they, they don't necessarily appreciate that value, they, but they'll tend to hold a slightly closer connection with that brand longer term. They just won't know why. Right. And you will see, you will understand why you maintain a closer connection with that brand because right. you can see there is a slightly, there's a slower burning nature and there's a, I wouldn't say a gift, but there's a, there's a delivery of something without it being a broadcasted 30 second spot. Right. And, that, and I think that, when I, go, go, sorry. when I was saying it has to matter before, this is kind of what I meant. Like there has to be some reason for it. And there has to be, whether that's about helping people have a more joyful time at home or 
helping people create something they can share with someone. The, the pay, there's two payoffs there, right? If you're a brand who's created something for Insta or for um, any of the other platforms, you're giving people the ability to create a thing which makes them part of a big club of people who are creating this thing if you launch it right. But then they can also share it with their own audience and friends. And there's lots of little moments of pleasure in all of that. And actually, mm. when you start thinking about these digital outputs and these these digital touch points, you're, you're right in the middle of culture there. And actually, what we try and do a lot in, in Earned particularly um, is to find the right sweet spot in culture where we can become super relevant. And I know when you're developing technology and uh, filters, whatever it is, any of this stuff, it's about actually how do we find the moment or the, mm. the bit of culture that we can get really close to? And mm. I think that some of those references there from the, the, the filters there are really good examples of how you lean into people's passions and, and start to align with that stuff. We're doing more and more of that. And we're trying to find actually where you can authentically um, talk about stuff in, a, in, in environments, but also ways which are um, useful for everyone rather than the broadcast piece. Cool. It's, it's hard because it's, it, there's, such a, there's such a traditional setup there. You're, uh, you know, to go back to the, I can't believe it, like the Borat thing is like the central thread of all of this, but, but the Borat thing is, is, a, is to a certain extent the guaranteed win. So, so in the conversation, and I'm sure Nathan has this all the time. The conversation in the you know, with with the clients is is always okay. This is really interesting, but I don't I don't necessarily know what I don't know, and so that's that's concerning. And now, am I willing to lose X to be able to achieve a step in the right direction somewhere else? And and people, you know, people's jobs are on the line, and and you know, people are in a situation where they. Maybe maybe all they have to do this year is is to maintain an existence for a business. Um, and if you're having to do that, and and then someone's coming to you and saying, "I've got an idea that costs you know two fifty, one million, and six million, then then suddenly there's you know people think, mm, "I'm going to maintain the status quo." And I think that's it's not that there aren't it's not that there aren't lots of people who have done it this year. I th I think I think one thing with the um, with it kind of being meaningful i think there's been a lot of kind of there's there's been a lot of stuff that was intended to be thoughtful and has come across as a bit trite um and and there's other stuff that's just been very very innocently meaningful to people there are brands that have almost accidentally looked incredible <laughs> and it, and and you and you sort of think where you know was that even considered did they even know but people do there's remember. Big, yeah, they do. And I think that there's a big difference between being worthwhile and being worthy. And mm. when you get into the worthy territory, particularly at the moment, it can all start to unravel quite quickly in terms of people um, being very critical of what you're doing and finding any potential flaws in the uh, the plan or the people involved but also they're just that people aren't buying stuff that doesn't feel authentic. It, they're just not buying it. Mm. particularly in earned and actually earned is where you get beaten up and yeah. people will go for the jugular in that stuff i mean i think brad i think i think when you know you see certain pieces where you you sort of think okay you're selling this product like there's just no connection there's no there's no relationship and you need to accept that and move on you know you can't it's i mean coca-cola is a good one coca-cola is always a fun one because they kind of stray in between pure brilliance and kind of awfulness on a, on a kind of continuous basis um, but there are things that, you know, there are things that you see from Coke that you just think, oh my God, that's incredible. And then, and there was a Nike, it was an amazing Nike ad recently that you, I saw with the cuts of uh, different it athletes. So, that, yeah. And you so knew good. it was like, you knew it was like some like, like video editor person who just sat there and just went, I can do this and this is going to take me six hours. The, the, and there, the, was, the there was a motivation actually, behind that. I mean, mm -hmm. the secret that nobody knows is that the, the only people creative teams actually need are video editors. And that would be enough. <laughs> so actually, they can do basically everything. Um, if you have a good one, they're like, yeah, yeah, I know. I get that's the tagline. I get yeah, it. I get, I'll, I get. I'll get, like, you don't, don't even speak it to me because it's going to be here. You just come in and you can just you know track changes on the words later. Um, I've got the imagery. Basically, I've got the whole campaign, and I wasn't even in your six-hour session with the client. It's fine. But you so, know that with yeah. the, you know that with that night, but with that night conversation, you right. know that it was like a flash idea, 
Right. It was a quick conversation. And the Nike's just in that lovely position over decades of it where they someone can just turn around and go, yeah, go for it. Right. Worst that can happen is we don't use it. Yep. And that, that pays an agency to go and try, which is great. I imagine that would have been pitched by someone, by them going in with like a five-second clip where they'd done it and bit gone just like, mm. we've got this idea for you, what if? And here it is in a... And I can imagine that just being like the sh a showstopper moment in a room where there's no slides, there's no... That, we've got an idea, what do you think of this? And then mm. everyone go, just go do it, give it a go, see if you can make Somewhere, it work. Yeah, the, 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 Nike, the Nike person just pulled out the money gun and just showered them. And just well, said, go, go and make this 45 seconds. Thank you very much. It's so amazing. It's yeah, so incredible. amazing. Yeah, I mean, you he know was, so, yeah, Sorry, Brett, go. No, but just thinking, as, as you said, so they probably, they went in to pitch it like that. But then that, you know, that gets me thinking, how many, and, and maybe you won't admit to this, but how many pitches have you been involved with where you came in with like the manifesto film and it was a bunch of stock imagery and an inspirational track and I was like, doo, 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 and we must act now, right? And that's not so different from what that video was, <laughs> except that they didn't use stock video and then they, you know, so they actually filmed it and then they had the split screen stuff. So it was about two clicks away from the original thing that everybody could have pitched at any time. But somehow with just that little bit of finesse, they were able to make it into like the masterpiece video, you know, edit of the year. Um, so you see like the, how, you know, there's not so much distance from those things, but there's so much craft in between those things. Do you, you not know? think? Hey, do yeah. you not think also having worked with with uh, with a company that will remain nameless in New York who produced a lot of kind of ident stuff and mm -hmm. uh, um, and strangely enough, I looked at uh, Nathan and I got a shared connection with them actually. But um, the, the you could you could see the difference between when they were produced when anyone's producing work for the brief and when someone's just got a really really great idea and they really believe in it and they deliver it. <clears throat> you can smell the difference between the two. You can always see it, always, always see it. And that's why that night thing stood out so much because <clears throat> it was like, no, that was an idea before all of this. I mean, it's just someone's right. in someone's head and it's just found this the kind of beautiful kind of sort of cross section of timing and kind of moment at one. That's, that's, it was amazing. Yeah. Well, I wish I had, I, <clears throat> I could queue it up right now, but that's not how my technology works. So I can't just be <clears throat> like, Sandra, queue it up. You know, um, there's no Sandra. <laughs> So, uh, Sa Sandra's she's called Alexa. Moment, right? <laughs> no, I no, Alexa is not allowed in my house. Um, Sandra <laughs> is my human personal assistant um, AI, who's also, uh, also anyway, but and and the producer of this uh, this show. You can tell she she really failed on the lighting today and on my outfit. Right. So I failed on lighting as well, guys. Sorry, it's, it's, it's a new flat. I basically don't know what's going on anymore. I just couldn't just flicking um, random switches. Yeah, but just just to close, just to, one one more thing I want to talk about before we go is just this other piece of work from FH that you did for Iceland Air. Um, mm -hmm. So this is an example of reinventing something that always happened for this year, as I understand it, right? Yep. So so basically, um, Iceland Airwaves happens every November. Um, uh, it's this weekend, my birthday weekend, actually. I've been many times. I, I used to work for some years on the Icelandic tourism and uh, a, a campaign called Inspired by Iceland um, whilst I was at the Brooklyn Brothers. We did lots of work with the festival, but this year, for obvious reasons, um, the festival itself is not happening. It's a wild uh, four-day weekend of official venues and off venues over the whole of Reykjavik, and it's like intense to go to it's one of the most incredible weekends but you have to have like a good stint of drying out before you go and drying out when you get home it's like heavy drinking lots of partying and some of the most amazing music like some of the bands out there in iceland are just incredible but this year it's all gone online so um it's actually they, they've replaced it with this event called Live from Reykjavik, which is a group of musician, a group of bands are playing over uh, tomorrow and Saturday. Um, and there's some incredible artists playing, but they, um, Iceland Air is one of the big um, businesses involved in lots of stuff that goes on in Iceland. Um, and they're one of the sponsors of, um, of Airwaves. So they have. Um, been involved in helping pivot into this digital um, version of the festival, which is a, a smaller version, but a, a version nonetheless. So they're doing a bunch of live streams from Beautiful Theatre in downtown Reykjavik. Um, but we um, we work with an 
agency in Iceland, one of our affiliates, um, an ad agency out there called Hvita Husid. Um, and we've been working with them on a bunch of stuff to support the festival in the next few days. And we've created this platform, which is about what does Iceland sound like? And you can basically um, use it to play different sounds of nature and various things into a track. Um, so you should go have a look at that and play on it. But the point here is about how we could use digital to create environments for people to be in whilst the live stream was going on. So the whole point here is that you can go in and there's something going on around um, the outsides of the main acts of music that people can still be involved in so that they can play, have a fun time and generally just not, you don't want people to disappear between sets or, or lose interest. It was just a little bit of something we could create that gave them a place to hang out and play. Um, so that's all live from tomorrow. But I think what's been really interesting about this stuff and some of these um, these sort of pivots that people have done is there's been quite a lot of optimism um, for 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 a while about um, about being able to still make events happen. And there was a belief for a long time that like it will still happen, it will still happen, and people were doing it about all sorts of different live events. And we've worked with whole hosts of different types of clients to help them pivot to to digital versions of stuff and i think that we're going to quite you know that creative coalition festival we talked about at the beginning of this dialogue um was a really good example of it being done well but actually we're all seeking new ways to make these digital experiences resonate really well and actually feel like they the, the right thing to be doing from big clients like um, Bayer pharmaceutical where we've hosted town halls for five thousand people through to um you know workshops online like we're having to find different ways of engaging with people and i think we need to get on our front foot a bit with technology and start to think about how we integrate more of it into things because at the moment it's like a revolution every time that we do something mm -hmm. and we need to get to a mindset where these things are about evolutions and actually the world when we move beyond now people are going to expect more digital stuff. We're thinking digital first about things. We're thinking about how does this live remotely? We're also looking at things from a point of view of how do you get people um, over the next couple of years, people are going to expect every event to be able to be as, a, as fulfilling vi virtually as it is um, in the real world. And we have to start working out what some solutions are now. Like this, this is a long-term thing. It's not going away. And I mean, even way after everyone's had their vaccine, people are still going to want more of this stuff, which makes digital experiences richer. I think that I yeah, I think the the perfect scenario would be that all of this evolution that's gone on this year is then becomes the companion piece to all the live events from next year. I, I think it would be it would be a shame if it does go back. I suspect some of it will. But it, it, you know, I, I didn't know about the festival. I'm looking through it; it looks incredible. And uh, but it, but I, I probably won't be able to be there. So, you know, why would it not be all, all be broadcast online so that you can reach, you know, potentially hundreds of millions of people with the same event? And it, it, the, the disconnect is, the disconnect has traditionally been very, very strong. And, and now putting video after the event is is not, I don't think, is enough anymore. And I, I hope that I hope that it it becomes. They go hand in hand from, you know, whatever it's going to be, you know, August next year or whatever it is. And, and Alex, I think that actually uh, echoes a point that we've made on a lot of previous episodes is that um, on, you know, in the in the past, which seems like a century ago, but was last year or even early this year, there yeah, were this year. Two, 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 ty two job types, right? There was the people who did stuff digitally and people who did stuff physically. Uh, mm -hmm. And those were just two divergent paths. And sometimes they came together, but only very briefly. Right? So, and now everyone needs to be, you know, you, you have to wear both hats as Nathan and I are doing. Let's just switch hats. Wouldn't that be cool if we just switched? And then um, that would oh, literally be witchcraft. That would have been awesome. Um, uh, and and I, no, that I, would be, no, that would be a platform. Yes. Um, and, and, no, I and, think there's, yeah. Do that. Go ahead. I, I think that, I think that the, um, one of the kind of, to a certain extent, is that it, there's still a lot of conversation in agencies in brands about we we should add we should potentially add a digital element, and I think that's because in some places in some conversations it it's it is still viewed with a kind of okay maybe we, we don't have that capability so we're not going to suggest it as much or we don't have that experience or we've never done one before so is the client really going to believe us 
if we say about if we talk about doing it it's it's something it's it's something that is is in is in the mix now whether anyone likes it or not um but i think that it's the the agencies present company included agencies are are consciously thinking about it but sometimes are not necessarily resourced to be able to to provide all of it so I think that there's a point happening right there, Alex, where we have to start to, in the best interests of our clients and in the best interests of delivering what they need, we have to start removing some of those interagency barriers that pop up where actually mm-hmm. you just referenced it there. But like, if you don't have something in your skill set, sometimes you can be either not know about mentioning it or be wary of doing it because it might eat some of your budget up Mm. as an omnicom agency we've got like there's an agency for everything so you just go Mm. into the portal and i need a whatever agency and there's someone who will do the thing but um you're totally right i think there's a lot of like this is our little bit of something and if we get someone else involved it might not have as much value for us we have to get over that because our clients need better from us Mm. Yeah, I think yeah. so. I, I think I think it's something that it's coming. You, you know, we experience it as a as a as a technology company that provides into agencies mainly in the US, but but worldwide. Um, you do you do end up in those situations where people say, "Okay, so we want we've got this idea. We haven't talked to anyone yet, but can we scope this and get it in front of people and make it do A, B, C, and D? Whether that's mobile or big screen or whatever it is." Um, and they're the ones that work the best because instead of instead of arriving to this kind of your your potentially a vendor, that's never a great place to be. Whereas if someone arrives and says, "Hey, like, hey, fellow creative, we'd like to talk to you about doing something cool that will be a companion piece to ours," then everyone arrives at the same level and they kind of go, "Yeah, all right, well, you know, we'd we'd like to get involved." Um, that's that's always the best way. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like- the best way. Yeah, but go ahead, Nathan. Go, Brett. Yeah. No, no, you, please. I was going to say, I think, actually, I wish that we were able to work a bit more like that with clients often, where actually, instead of being in pitch cycles, where you're going in mm-hmm. with what, what, you know, you have to get your best ideas out that you know are going to be bigger than the client's potentially going to want to do. They're going to be more ambitious than they're ever going to be able to probably deliver. And you know that something that you will end up doing might be... 60 or 70 percent of what you pitch in a room but you have to go in with all of this work and energy going into the big thing so that you can win the room to get to the 60 percent version i wish we didn't have to do that i wish we could go in with the right solutions for people which means the right technology the right platforms the right thinking and do it in a way which was about trying each other out i think we should date clients i think we should do projects together i think we should be in a situation where they're like here's x amount of money let's try this out or even if you put half in each you know it costs a fortune to do a pitch what if we just like went halves on it and did a project together and see what happens but it's the same with technology we have to be more collaborative about it we have to find a way of doing it which is about um as you say creatives coming together and going we can make something awesome here let's go sell it to someone Mm. Yeah, and also add value. I think I think one of the but like I'm going to reference Bora again. I'm going to do it. It's going to come back. I'm going to we're going to go full cycle. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's aside. It's aside from the setups when you just need to get press. I, I I'm I'm like I'm absolutely always been fascinated by the idea of actually turning up and saying we we could put something in that p- can potentially be uh, almost a product like addition to the company that can actually generate money as well as awareness and promotion at the same time. I'm more, I'd like, I, I think that that increasingly is going to be a, is going to be a huge market of getting, of getting under the hood of the business and fully understanding that we, we're not going to build you a 30 second spot. What we're going to do though, is we're going to develop this thing and this thing's going to live with that toothpaste for the next six years. It, almost impossible, but but I just I love the idea of it being something where even the CFO in the room can't, can't argue the point. They can't, you know, the marketing person go, oh yeah, we got this new, but the CFO's going, well, hold on a minute, that made us money. Like that made us money aside from selling that particular product on top, and and you see it sometimes, but it's I, I think the real value going forward is going to be like all of all of us. I think is is going into businesses and providing 
a, a grander value than than a, than being put into a pitch cycle, which I don't think I don't honestly think anyone wants. Nobody. I don't wants think anyone that. really Nobody enjoys it. <laughs> no, we can't um, do that. I stopped doing it, and that's why. Yeah, I don't do it anymore because I yeah, we don't pitch. Yeah, we <laughs> so, don't. Yeah, we don't, but, we don't uh, pitch. I, just because yeah. it's impossible to control. Yeah. I think. I think from Nathan's. It, Nathan's setup and, and the company that he works within, it's probably a little bit easier to, there's a, there's more trust going on between the companies that you work with. Um, but it, it, the, the, the mutual kind of mistrust in kind of cold pitching is to, no, one, no one's giving the greatest work because they're, because why would they reveal it? <laughs> it's like, I don't know where it's going. Where does it disappear to? You know? So it's very clear that we have another, um, agency life episode built in <laughs> that we are segueing to which we would love to do yes um, which yeah, maybe yeah, we yeah. should come back and do and because i really also wanted us to get on to um you know i've worked for a big agency nathan has actually we all have um and then we've also probably done roles where we're like the the vendor or the partner um mm -hmm. i think that's such an interesting dynamic for everybody every, every creative or every every person who works with brands or clients and we should definitely explore that but not today because it's over now so, uh, <laughs> and that's how we end the show. I want to thank you guys uh, for coming on. I'm going to put on your names just one more time. We've got Alex Polson, who's the CEO of Indy. Um, we've got Nathan Woodhead, creative director, Nathan Woodhead, uh, creative director at Fleischman Hillard Fishburne. My name is Brett Kobe. I'm the host of this show, AR Explainer. Um, and we'll be back again for another episode. Yeah, should we come for another cool. episode some other yeah, time? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, yeah. I, like, I, I think we'll all have it. to temper ourselves to do the second okay. episode because I think it could get a bit more grainy. But I'm up for it. I'm totally okay, up for so it. we're going to leave you I with am, this, yeah, yeah. this final thought, which is this picture, um, <laughs> followed by this picture. Um, no, the Borat, the Borat one's just the what? That's like the thread that keeps us all together. I think. Followed by thumbs up for donuts. We love donuts. Sorry. Krispy Kreme. Mm. From a meter away and oh, oh it's over now.